This, uh, this lecture tonight that we have is uh, to begin with is a miracle. How, what's the cause that brought us all together here? Uh, how many, uh, what was it when you called me the first time? Was it a year ago? Yeah, when was, yes. about a year ago. Uh, you know, uh, Avram Avramov, it's a good name, double Avraham here. He called me up one time and he told me about his problem with the kidney. Finally, he was scheduled to get it and something went wrong and he didn't know what to do. It was a very serious situation. And that's how we got together in first time. And now, Baruch Hashem, we are after the miracle that Hashem did to him. And he brought some, his, some of his friends. And uh, you do not know it, maybe. Just for that, it was worth it. Even though it probably was a lot of suffering, a lot of aggravation. But just for some Jews to come here, one hour of words of Torah, multiplied by how many people came, the reward to have a, an event like this in your house is so huge. When, uh, when, when eventually God pays back to a person who organized a Torah lecture, that even all that suffering and all that money lost and all the, the pain and the agony and the, and the nervous breakdown and anything a person has, just for that it was worth it. I know it sounds not realistic, but in the end, we all see that I'm right because I'm not making it up. It's a 100% a promise that God gave in a Torah. Now, I went a little bit too far. Let me go back to step one. Uh, I do not know any of you, but I understand there's a few cu married couples here. But I want to ask anyone here, without, uh, without being embarrassed, has anyone here that have any doubts whatsoever if the Torah that the Jews have, it's a divine book. Anybody here who has a doubt, please don't be embarrassed. The written Torah, the oral Torah, the Ten Commandments, anything that you may have a doubt, now it's the time to ask me that I know where to start. Even though I brought you uh, MP3 CDs here, free, you can have them for free, and has a lot of fantastic lectures that already have hundreds of thousands of listeners this, on the website, Baruch Hashem, in the last few years. It's all on one CD. You have Torah and Science here, part one, part two, part three. You have preparation for eternal life. What does it mean, Shabbat? The eternal covenant between the Jewish nation and God. Uh, Musar talk, ethics. Garden of Eden, free choice, the debate, the debate with the priest, Judaism versus Christianity. We have uh, family purity and modesty, the secret of marriage, intermarriage, the problem of intermarriage, uh, the Jewish way of dating, and there's many other lectures here. A courtesy of one uh, nice person, Emmanuel, that sat and edited everything together and made them into one CD. You can have them free as I said, in the, you know, after the lecture. Uh, I promise you one thing, that after you listen to this CD from A to Z, you will never ever in your history will have any doubt that Judaism is the only authentic, real religion, the book of God, the creator of the world, and then you will understand maybe for the first time in your life how lucky you are to be Jewish. Most of the Jews have no idea how lucky they are. They're all prince and princess, and they do not know. Imagine a prince was born somewhere, and he never f went to find out who is his father. All his life is one big mistake. One day he finds out, when he's 60 years old, that he could have had the best life, and yet he was uh, cleaning the garbage on the street. And all these years, you know, he, had the, the, he could have had the best thing. Now, going back to the beginning point, 3,321 years ago, the creator of the world gathered few million people for the first and last time in history and spoke to them. Something like this never happened before. It never happened after. It happened only one time in history. And who were these people? The Jewish nation. Even though the word Jewish doesn't exist yet, because Judaism is going to start right after the Torah will be given, but this is even before the Torah was given. It's God speaking to Moshe, then he goes up to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes down later, 
and he begins to bring the Torah, the oral Torah, parts of the written Torah, the Ten Commandments. All three major religions in the world follow this Torah. Christians never ever doubted the Torah. They never tried to say that God never gave Jews the Torah. Nobody ever had the guts to come and contradict one letter of the Torah. Not the Christians, not the Muslims. Many of the cults out there, they all follow the Torah. Many of the things you see in the world is based on the Torah. The only ones who have the nerve to doubt the Torah and criticize it, and most of the time, 100% comes from total ignorance, that they never read the Torah even once in their life, they have no idea what it is. The only ones who have the nerve to criticize the Torah mainly are the Jews. In Israel, in America, in Russia, Jews that have no idea what the Torah is. I've been speaking for 16 years, and probably this is more than 4,000 times that I gave a lecture already, and I never found one secular Jew, not even once, that read the Torah carefully from A to Z. Not even one. <laughs> Think about it. I, I saw who knows how many thousands of people, and I always ask this question, and not one of the secular Jews ever read the Torah. Does it make sense to you? that there is a claim out there that the creator of the world gave a book, book of instruction how to live, what to do, what not to do, and it's subject, subject to a huge reward in the afterlife or, God forbid, a punishment. If a person goes against God or if he goes with God and listens to him, there's a big difference what's going to happen to him when he dies. Does it make sense to you that a clever person will have this book in his shelf all his life or by his parents' house and not once in his life he's going to spend a day to analyze, to investigate what's in it. What, what, what is this book that is the best seller in history? All over the world for thousands of years, almost every person in the world owned that book in different languages, in many different languages. The Greeks translated it, the Arabs, the Persian, the Russian. In every language you have this book. Everywhere you go, it's the number one seller in history. So many millions of people gave their life for this book. Does it make sense that everyone was dumb? All the great Jewish philosophers, the greatest people in history that lived according to this book, everyone was stupid, everyone was foolish, and I am the genius that lived like a goy, like I have no wounds in my life, I don't have a direction, I don't have a, nothing in my life. I live the day. I want to make money, I want to be healthy, I want to get married, I want to have children. But we have to understand. All these dreams that people have, the monkeys has the same dreams. The monkeys also wants to have kids. They also like to swim. They also like to jump on the trees, what we call sport. They also like to eat good food. Uh, all the, what we like to do, the animals has the same. What's the difference between us and the animal? Are we just another species in nature? There are two million different kinds of animals. Are we are two million and one? You know? Or we are different than the animals? That's the question. Who can come and tell me here what's the difference between a person to an animal? What's the difference? Intellect. Yeah, intellect. Yeah, many animals are very intelligent. Uh, as a matter of fact, they took seven or eight college students from the best college somewhere in America, and they compared their intelligence to a monkey, a chimpanzee, and a chimpanzee won all the, all the battles. Uh, the, the, the chimpanzee was getting two peanuts every time we would answer the correct answers. He has to go by the right order. They go on a computer screen and they go one, two, three, four in different random orders. And then when it disappeared from the screen, the, the monkey has to press seven or eight times in the right order. Which one came, which box came first? All the students fail and the monkey always remember all the orders. So you can see they're not dumb. They're very stupid. They're very smart. They're not like what we think. The animals are parakeet, parrot, birds that connect between each other from 40 miles away, bees, butterflies. There's a lot of intelligence in nature. So intelligence is not a good answer. What's the difference between a person to the animals? Can you give me one reason why it's better to be a person and not a monkey? Every average secular person who lives in this world dream, dream to achieve in his life what the monkey has from the first moment he was born. Think about it. What's the average dream of a secular person? Women, pleasure, money, ego, sport, nice place to live, great food to eat. They have it in the first day. 
You see, the dog that comes every day to, or the squirrel that come to my garbage and they rip the bags, and now they don't know what to eat. Chinese, pizza, chicken, steaks, leftover. They do, they do not, yeah, they have a great variety, free of charge. Uh, it's fresh, it's usually from today. You know, and they don't have to bother preparing it. They don't have to shop. They don't have to stand online. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to work for uh, 10 hours to prepare one dinner for the family. They don't have all this headache, and they don't suffer that they eat leftover. See, if they know that they like homeless, looking in the garbage, he suffers. But an animal, the dog, doesn't feel anything wrong eating the leftover from the family's uh, dinner. So he enjoys very much eating the, the, the bones. And to every day, and you see the cats, my son feed the cats, every day he puts something, the cat in one month became triple. Every hour, every hour the cat shows up looking for food, you know, and they enjoy very much. The squirrels, every, all the animals in our neighborhood, we have deers, we have bears where we live, bears. They all have great food, they enjoy the food, and everything is fine. We have to worry a lot more to enjoy the food, what they have every day from the minute they are born. We have to raise children, we have to put a lot of sweat and efforts in their life, lots of worrying, suffering, financial problems, until your son one day become a person, changing diapers, vaccines, surgeries, this, that, all kinds of problems, buying a bigger house, working extra hours. The deer was born, two minutes later he played basketball already. You know, the monkey was born in a safari, two minutes later he jumped on the trees, no diapers, no worry, no vaccine, no surgeries, no doctors, no nothing, no college, no high school. It, don't, it doesn't cost a million dollars to raise a kid. You know, the animals have a very easy life if you compare. The eagle was born, he traveled all over the world for free. He doesn't have to pay $2,000 for a ticket if he wants to see Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem, one day after he fly, he enjoy. He goes there. The birds are traveling all over the world for free. They have beautiful view. They have great food. They have great personal life between the male and the female. Everything is beautiful. So give me one reason why it's better to be a person. I never found any reason. Show me. Maybe you convince me. You have any reason why it's better to be Rachel, Yitzchak, Moshe, Avram, Yosef, or to, uh, than to be a chimpanzee in Africa? No. What do you say? <laughs> huh? <coughs> what do you say? Did you ever see a chimpanzee with gray hair? <laughs> or bald? They don't have stress. We have stress, anxiety attack. Half of the American people live on Prozac. The monkeys don't need it. They don't have stress. Imagine life without stress, how great it could be. Imagine your life without ever worry about money, about health, about marriage problems, about raising children. Take it out of your life completely. You never ever worry. Everybody will agree that you're the happiest person you know, in, in, in history, no? Yeah. When did you have a person that 70 years never worried once? Yeah, Where? But people, but people, people have a purpose. There's a purpose that people have in life. The animals also have purpose. They have, they have the simple, simple need that everybody else has, which is whatever you said. But people have purpose, whether it's no Torah, whether it's raising your kids or whatever else, is there's a purpose. Right. You want to live in the afterlife, which animals don't worry about. All right. Uh, first of all, I agree with what you say. Not that you're saying something wrong, but uh, who needs a purpose? I still rather be a chimpanzee without a purpose than Yosef with a purpose. <laughs> you know what? I, you know? I agree with you 100%. Ah. There is no purpose. <laughs> so uh, we have a purpose. I, I need a purpose. Let me sleep like the Bronx Zoo, the lion, 25 years on a rock. They bring him the food. Everyone takes picture of him. He gets so much attention. So the lion and the Bronx Zoo, since I'm a little kid, he's still there on a rock. <laughs> Laying there all day. Maybe a different rock this time. No, you know, yeah. Well, well, what could be greater life? Ask every other person. What, would you like a life that you every day lay on the beach all your life and you don't have to worry about anything? Of course he would take it, no? Who needs traffic, New York, your boss abuse you, find a job, six months you're unemployed, this, you need to, to, to beg the government, this, that. Who knows how many problems? They don't have it. They don't have to work 30 years to buy a house. Life is very simple. Male and female. Huh? How many of these Israeli guys came to New York with the American dream? I make, I'll meet a beautiful Jewish girl, get married, her father will be rich. 
he'll help me in my life. What do I have in Israel? They come to America, they kill themselves. They have to put all the show, learn English, you know, all these things. Finally, maybe they meet a girl and they get married and have to work 30 years until they buy a house. The monkeys, he walks, he walks in a safari, he sees a female, she moves her tail, he moves his tail. Two minutes later, they have twins. He <laughs> doesn't have to buy her a drink, doesn't have to put a show. She doesn't ask him on the first day, so what do you do? <laughs> they don't have all this show off. Right the way, want to, uh, you like me, you like me, you don't like me, doesn't matter, we animals. Oh, that's it. But he has seven wives, everywhere he goes, nobody gives him the show here. Oh, uh, doesn't have to wait on the club in a freezing Manhattan night until the black guy, the, the bouncer, will let him in. He has to give him $50 to let him in. Maybe he'll meet another Christine tonight. Doesn't have all this. Bottom line, you agree with me that there's no reason why it's better to be a person, or you still have, you want to think about it? No, there has to be a reason. Beginning. What do you think I'm heading to? You think I came to tell you some jokes tonight? <laughs> I have a direction, but I'm preparing the trap. You know? You know how they catch the monkeys in China? They give them, believe it or not, it's not a joke. The monkeys uh, in China, they like Bukhari and bread, uh, rice, Bukhari and rice, spiced rice, Bukhari and Persian, similar. So what they do, they take a box, plastic, clear box with holes from all directions. They put that rice inside and the smell of the rice, the monkey smell it from far and begin to come. And the monkey push his hand in and he pick up the rice. Now he's about to take his hand out, but when the hand is closed, it doesn't come out of the hole. So then the Chinese hunters come right away with their sword or whatever, and they catch him. And then they take him, and they tie his hands to the trees with a rope. They tie a rope here and a tie a rope. They tie him to two trees with the legs and the hands, and they take a sharp razor, and they begin to open his skull while he's still alive. They pick up the top of the head, and they sit around with a spoon and eat his brain while he's alive, until he dies. That's what they do in China, in Japan. It's a very, very expensive, del delicious food for them. Like the, the rich people can afford it. They sit around the monkey and eat his brain, and then, then they invent laptops, they invent cellular phones over there. Everything is made in China, made in Japan, no? These are the people that invent the things that we use every day. That's what happened. The question is, why the monkeys don't leave the rice and run away? You see, you cannot get your hand out. Op open, the, open the rice, get it out, and, get, and save your life. The desire of the animal is so strong that once the desire is exist, the brain doesn't think. That's it. We, some of us, also the same thing like the animals. Right? A person go and want to make a scene. There's a chance that this woman will give him some kind of disease. It's going to be the end of his life. So for 10 minutes, it's going to be, it's going to end his life. But he doesn't think. Why? The desire of the 10, 20 minutes destroys his life, can destroy his family. But he doesn't think. Same thing in business. Someone promised you 20% interest on your money. Who is he? Now, just the desire to make so much money doing nothing make you lose all your money. It happens to many people, Madoff and all the rest. The desire is strong, people don't think. You give a guy, even religious guy, very, very delicious food, but there's a doubt if it's kosher or not. Once the food is in front of him, he's not always thinking anymore. It's too late already. He eats, then he regrets. The desire will overcome the head, the thinking. Going back to what I say, let's conclude. There's anybody here that can give me an answer why it's better to be a person? So you all agree with me that it's better to be a monkey? Huh? Wait for a reason. Oh. Now let's see what God has to say in the Torah. God says in the Torah, there is no advantage to the people than the animals whatsoever. No advantage. Which means the animals are better in anything. In strength, in sport, in speed, in everything they have, it's better. Except one difference. 
one difference. It's the divine, eternal soul that a person has that is going to be judged in the afterlife in, the, in front of the king of all kings, God himself. That's the only advantage that the soul has. What did we learn from this? First, that the person has a soul and the animals don't. Okay. What is that soul? We don't know yet. We know it's eternal. It will never die. We know it's something spiritual. It's not physical. It's something spiritual. It's a spiritual energy. And the fourth thing, it's going to be judged. Can you change the chair? Just sit, sit over there in the corner. And this chair makes noise. Yeah. Sit over there. So, yeah. So it says, it says the, 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 that soul is going to be judged. Did you ever hear about a person who goes to a trial that he calls it an advantage? That's a disadvantage. Who wants to be trialed? Who wants to stand in front of a judge? Even if you're the one who sue, you still don't feel great about going to court. I never know a person who likes to go to court, especially when someone trial you, No. So why it's an advantage? God wrote in the Torah that this is an advantage. Because unlike different trials, different trials, somebody sues you, you can only lose or stay the same. Either they take a million dollars away, or you get away with that. You stay what you are. Over here, this trial has two sides. You can earn a lot, or you can lose a lot. Since you can earn a lot, and it's 100% in your free choice, in your end, to decide if you're going to earn or if you're going to lose, it's an advantage. If you didn't take advantage on this opportunity, it's your fault, you pay the price, and it doesn't change the reality. It's still an advantage. You just didn't come. Here, money on the floor, come, come collect. I'm not in the mood. Two, two minutes later, he regret, it's too late already. I gave you the opportunity. I put you here 70 years. I gave you Torah. Torah in Hebrew means instructions. Oraah. Torah comes from the word oraot, instructions. The Torah says, I'm giving you the life and the good, the bad and the death. And you should choose the good. You can also choose the bad. Nobody will interfere with your choices. You want to eat pork? Who gives you the money to buy it? I give you the money. Who gives you the ability, the ability to move your jaws and your teeth and your stomach, digest the pork? Then when you need to exit the, the waste, everything that happened in your body, thanks to me. The, the job that you have, that you are able to buy yourself the pork, I gave you. The oxygen that you breathe while you're eating, something that I told you not to eat, I give you. Why? Why am I helping you to make a scene? No. I set up the rules of nature here. I help you to do whatever you want. It's up to you to decide if you want to listen to me or you want to betray me. And I won't interfere with you. I will only interfere if you're about to damage somebody else that doesn't deserve it. Then I will prevent you from succeeding. But if you want to destroy yourself, I won't interfere. You want to eat poison, you eat poison, you'll die. You want to help others, I'll help you to help others. You want to steal from others, I'll help you if they deserve it. They deserve to lose money, and you want to steal from them, then I'll put you together. They don't deserve to lose, then I'll protect them from you. But you yourself, everything that you do, it's up to you. Everything. You want to curse, it's up to you to curse. You want to pray, it's up to you to pray. You want to get up early in the morning, you want to continue to sleep until midnight, it's 100% your free choice. You want to keep my Shabbat? It's an eternal covenant that I made between me and my Jewish children. For that, I will give you endless pleasure in the afterlife. Or you want to violate Shabbat? It's up to you. I will not interfere with you. You want to drive to the mall? You want to watch television? You want to smoke? I do not interfere. I let you continue to live. I help you in a business. I do whatever I want to do. But in the end... Now we begin to analyze every second of your life. How long is the trial once a Jew is dead? When the Jew dies, the soul exits the body, the body goes to the worms, and the soul goes right back to the court of heaven. How long does it take to trial a person? One year. 
That's the reason that in Judaism, when a person dies, we make Kaddish for him for one year. Why not three years? Why not six months? Why not two weeks? Why one year? Because one year the trial is going on. Why does it take a year? Because every second of his life is being viewed on a screen. It's all spiritual over there. There's no more bodies. Same feelings that you have, your memory, your conscious, your subconscious, doesn't come from the body. The body is two dollars. In a chemical laboratory, you can put together a body for two dollars. Iron, minerals, salt, water, all the ingredients of the body, it's two dollars if you buy it by... But what's the value of a person? The soul. Love, hate, jealousy, uh, kindness, uh, knowledge, intelligence, this is all the soul. Who sees? The body doesn't see anything, the body is dead. The body, if you take a liver of a person and chop it to slices and put it in a butcher, 9.99 a pound. Nobody will be able to tell the difference between the, the stomach of the cow and the stomach of a person. Or the brain of a person or the brain of the cow. Or, or muscle or, or anything. It's all the same. You put it by the butcher, nobody will tell the difference. The body is dead all the time. Imagine you yourself going to a big balloon and the balloon is moving left and right. The balloon is dead. You are the living power. You're moving the balloon. Same thing the body. The soul is inside. The soul moves the body. The soul decides. Do I want to go there or not? Do I want to listen to God or not? Oh, I should go. Fine. Oh, a poor person is begging for food now. Help. It's my choice. I want to help him or I want to ignore him to die. It's my choice. Later I will get either rewarded for it or punished. Depends what I chose. To make sins, to cheat, to be violent, not to respect your wife in a marriage. What do you think? Yeah, the police didn't catch you this time. But, uh, but God recorded everything. In the end, everything will be viewed. All the cheatings, all the lying, all the stories. Where were you, Moshe? It's midnight. No, I had a long day in the office. Now you got away with that. In 40 years from now, everyone will watch this lie. And they will see in front of everyone where you went. And they'll show it to your wife, and to your mother, and to your grandfather. Everybody will see it. And the Torah wrote that the biggest, biggest punishment to a person, before we're talking about heaven, and hell, and Auschwitz, and all the other problems that the Torah speaks about, I'm not even going into it. We're not in this level yet. I'm talking the embarrassment. The embarrassment, the shame, is so huge that a person cannot bear the embarrassment. The shame is horrible pain. I'll give you an example. Did you ever see a, a, boxing, a boxing match? Mr. Millia, Williams fighting against Mr. Johnson. They punch each other for, I don't know, 40 minutes. Finally, Johnson is falling on the floor. What does Mr. Williams do? Yeah, he won the, the championship and 30 million dollars. What happened to Johnson that fell on the floor? Trying to get up. Trying to get up right away, no matter what, he will do everything he can, even though in one hour from now he will die in a hospital, because his brain is completely damaged from all the punches he got. The most important thing to him right now is to rise back on his feet and wave to the crowd, even though it's a very serious mistake to move in your situation. You shouldn't move. The more you move, the more you can be paralyzed. It doesn't matter. What is the first thing he wants to do? I'm still standing. I wasn't defeated completely. And he waved to the crowd, and everybody clap. He's willing to suffer all the physical pain, then one minute of embarrassment. One time I asked a guy from, from the yeshiva, I saw him dressed nice, tie in the middle of the day with a suit. I told him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Brooklyn. I said, well, well what's in Brooklyn? In the after you know, it was five, six in the afternoon. So he told me, I have a date. I'm going on a date with a girl, you know, Shiduch. So I told him, oh yeah, very nice. How do you go? So I take the bus. Yeah. Do you have money? I said, he said, yeah, I have a hundred dollars. I said, so where are you going? He said, I'm taking her to a restaurant or something. So I say, well, how do you have money? Because I know he's learning, he's a student, he doesn't have money. He said, the rabbi gave me, the Rosh Yeshiva. I told him I'm going on a date, so he gave me money. 
So I told him, oh, that's how it works here. Every time somebody needs something, he goes to the rabbi and he gives him money. So yeah, that's how it is. So I asked him, what did you feel when the rabbi gave you the $100 bill? He said, lousy. Felt embarrassment. What do I do? I don't have a choice. I needed the money. So I told him, if I'll bring a machine to the yeshiva, like an ATM machine that has a lot of money in it, and every time you need a hundred dollars, all you have to do is put your head in. There's two arms who grab your head. And the third arm gives you a punch, like in a boxing. Boom! To your forehead. You fall on the floor, and a hundred dollars is falling right next to you. Would you prefer to go to the rabbi and ask him for the hundred dollars? Or you prefer to get the punch and get the money? So of course get the punch. It's very simple, of course. Every one of us would rather get the punch than go and get embarrassed to ask a donation from someone. Did you ever see the poor people when they come and knock on the door, how they take their head down? They're embarrassed to look in your eyes. Why? What's the problem? Hey, shh, give me a hundred bucks, I'm hungry. No, no, give me a hundred bucks. You don't see it. You don't, you, usually they mumble. It takes three, four times until you understand what they want. The embarrassment kills them. The more I will give you, the more embarrassed you'll become from me. You won't be able to get for free. Then you begin to offer me help. If I give you unlimited money, credit card, you live by me, I give you a car, we do your laundry, we serve you three times a meal. After a week, you see me taking the garbage out, you run to help me. Nobody likes to touch garbage. Huh? Nobody likes it. It smells, it leaks, it's heavy, you're going to go all the way to the street. But why do you volunteer to help me? Because the more you receive from me, the more you feel that you want to do something in return. That's the human nature. This is how the divine soul reacts. But the body is the opposite. The body wants to sleep. They want pleasure, cigarettes, drugs, women, sport, swimming, you know, food. Oh, that's all the body wants. The soul, Torah, spirituality, kindness, mercy, gratefulness, holiness, complete different thing. And the purpose of life, it's the fight between the body and the soul. If the soul will win, you are righteous. If the body won, you fail. Now what happened to a person who fell? <coughs> Few options. One option, he comes back in another life, reincarnation. Hashem takes the soul and gives him another chance and put the soul in a new body. And then he's born in a different area, to a different family, sometimes different culture, different language, etc., etc. Sometimes he doesn't come back in Gilgul. You know, to come back in Gilgul, it's a privilege that you have another opportunity. You've got to start from the beginning. It's not exactly from the beginning, it's from where you uh, left life in your previous body. For instance, you take three kids, two years old, three babies, two, two, and two. And you give each one of them a bag of, uh, I don't know, candies, whatever. And then you come to the first one and say, give me one. He doesn't want to give you one. You just gave him the whole bag. Even one, he doesn't want to give you. You come to the second one, he gives you one. You ask another one, he gets angry. But he gives you the second one. The third one, forget about it. You're done with him. He runs away and he cries. You come to the third one, he eats one. He likes it very much. You say, give me, give me, give you the whole bag. You eat everything, he looks at you, he's upset, but he doesn't say anything. He gives, a, he gives you everything. We have to understand what's going on here. Nobody educated these kids to be stingy or to be generous. They don't know how difficult it is to get pretzels. Maybe I have millions of bags in my closet. Maybe it doesn't cost anything. Maybe I can give them as much as I want. They do not know anything about it. What makes the one of them doesn't want to give me one and the other one gave me the whole bag? This is exactly how they died. The first one died stingy, 75 years old in New York, a rich guy. He doesn't like to give tzedakah, donation, nothing. All for himself. Egoistic, doesn't care about anyone. He come to his trial. After his trial is finished, God say, you did some good things in your life. You kept Shabbat, you ate kosher, you did this. But there's serious problems in your test that you fail. I'm going to reincarnate you in another body. Now you're Moshe, now you're going to become Avram. You lived here, now you're going to be in this city. 
you live in, in this uh, mentality, now you're going to have this mentality. But I'm still going to give you money because you didn't pass your test. And I want to see if this time you're going to start giving donations, tzedakah, or you're only going to want everything for yourself. And he's born stingy as he died stingy. It continued from where he left. The second one was average. Sometimes give, sometimes not. Doesn't want to give too much. Here, five dollars, leave me alone. The third one was very generous. Every rabbi comes to him. Here, rabbi, take, no problem. What do you need? You want to make CDs? Here, take. You want to build a synagogue? Let me help you. You want to give food for the poor people and the widows? Come, I want to help you. What, whatever you need, tell me. Don't hesitate. This is generous people. You have here and there people like this. Why? They die like this. They already passed that. Anger. Some people are not angry. Some people are very angry. Where does it start? Age zero. As soon as you crawl on a rug, you take a toy, you see if he's angry or not. He begin to scream, he rolls, he rolls, he break things, he throw things. Crazy. Crazy. He died crazy. He was born crazy. The other one? Oh, no problem. He goes to the corner and cry. Some of them has big embarrassment. You just look at your little kid. He hides under the rug from the embarrassment. The other one don't care. He laughs in your face. That's how they died. The only way to pass the test is with the Torah. If you're not connected to the Torah, all your life is one big waste of time. You eat, you make money, you bought a nice Mercedes or Lexus, you go to Miami every month, you go here, you go there, all a waste of time. One day you died and you will pull all your hair off from wasting 70 years of opportunities that God gave you and you lost it all. Where does it say it in the Torah? I'm strong with you, I'm strict with you, I'm sorry, I'm strict with you, I torture you, to test what's in your heart. Will you keep my mitzvot or not? That's in another place, it says like this. I, I'm testing you to check what's in your heart. Do you love me or not? Do you appreciate what I've done for you or not? What's the purpose of this test? Why it's so important for you to test me? To reward you in your end. When your end will come in this world, then the reward will begin. And I don't want to tell you the rest of the verse. What happens if you fail? Because it's free choice. Same thing, a person can earn, a person can lose, right? You go, you sit on a blackjack table. You only make, you either make or you lose. That's it. If you earn, very good, you succeed. You achieved your purpose. You, came, you went there to make $1,000 today and you made it. If you lost, your situation is worse than it was in the beginning. Now, going back to my first question tonight. I started to tell you things from the Torah. But who said the Torah is divine? Maybe the rabbis made it up. Maybe the rabbis made it up. How do I know the Torah is from God? Everybody here understands that if the world is so sophisticated, so organized, so advanced, oxygen, water, trees, fruits, amazing things in this world, that there is obviously a creator to this world, or somebody thinks that the world started with a random accident explosion. Boom, there was some kind of explosion, and now all of a sudden there's billions of people, thinking, memory, brains, everything in place, everything by mistake. What do you think? A watch can be, can be made by an explosion, or it has to be a designer. A watch. If somebody walked into this room and said, this watch, I walked on the street, there was an explosion. Psh, all the pieces started to come from nowhere, and they connected together. Or the chain, everything, and now it's working. What would we say to this person? Crazy. Crazy, no? Crazy Eddie. <laughs> send, him <to> the <laughs> send him to the mental home right away. But we are much worse than him. We are much worse. He only said that the watch was made by itself. Some of us, as foolish as it may sound, can be professor in Harvard. So you know how the world started? A big bang. Psh, that's it. 
everything went into place. Rocks, mountain, water, oxygen all over the world, beautiful oranges, cucumbers, tomatoes, horses, dogs, this, that, brains, 10 trillion connection, everything always in the same place. What's going on here? Do you really believe that nonsense? The rule is like this, remember. If there is a creation, there must be a creator. We never found a creation without knowing there was a creator. We may not know him. I do not know who made that table. But I'm willing to swear on my life and my children's life and my wife's life that a human being made this table. How do I know? I didn't see. Somebody made it. How? I see it's measured, equal, glass, colors, two level. There's a plan. I cannot say this, this table was done by an explosion. If I will say such a thing, it will be the end, the last lecture I ever gave. Nobody wants to hear a, a fool, no? So here, the world is very, very advanced. Somebody made it. I don't know him yet, but for sure somebody made it. Did you ever see a creation without a purpose? Show me one thing ever in history that you can point. Somebody made it for no reason. There's none. This picture, this frame has a purpose? Yes. The camera has a purpose? Yeah. The CD has a purpose. The table has a purpose. The cell phone has a purpose. Everyone has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. The couch, the rug, the floor, the ceiling, the light bulbs. Everything has a purpose. Is it possible to think that this whole world was created by someone just like that? Without a reason? Of course not. What was his reason? Reviewing the world. What's the most important thing on earth? In the universe. The most important thing in this whole world. What is it? The human being. Everything was made for him. Animals for his use. Oxygen for his use. Metal, sand, trees, fruits, vegetables, diamonds, gold. Everything was made for him. The man, the mankind, is the master of the whole nature. He's in charge of everything. He uses everything that the nature has to offer. We control it. We take wood and we make tables. We take wood, we make houses. We use the oxygen. We use water. We use, we use the food. We control the animals, even though they're much stronger than us. We control them. We eat them. We kill them. We do whatever we want to them. We control nature. We control the food. We decide where the foods will grow. We have control completely in nature. So we see the whole world was made for us. So we are the most important thing in this creation. Comes the third question. If I'm the most important thing in the world and everything was made for me, what is my purpose in that case? It was important to the creator to make me. He made a male, he made a female. They continue the human race. They're bringing more children. And they are the most important thing here. What is my purpose? Comes the fourth question. Did you ever see anything that was manufactured and made by anyone without a manual instruction? You buy a laptop. It comes with a book. Yeah. You buy anything you buy. You buy a, everything always has instruction. Do this, do not do this, don't put it in the sun, don't put it in water, has in this temperature, that. Why are they so important to write the instructions? To get the best use out of the device. If they won't give you the instruction, you may have a laptop, you use 1% of what he has to offer. 99% goes to the garbage. Why they give you a book? Because they know without the book you will never learn to know the laptop on your own. Take your million years. So many functions, press three buttons, press two buttons. How would you know without a book? Who is entitled to write the book of instruction? Only the one who manufactured the device. Nobody else knows better than him. If the manufacturer of the world, which is God, gave us a book of instruction, the Torah, and he told us, I made the world for you, for the humankind, but not just for the humankind, for the Jews. You are my children. I chose you from all the nations to be mine. 
Don't imitate the goyim. Don't behave like them. Don't call your children to their, like their names. Don't eat their food. Do not marry them. You are special to me. I chose you. I separated you from all the nations. The nation of Israel, Am Levadad Ishkon, is an isolated nation. Uvagoim lo itchashav. It's nothing to do with the Gentiles. It's a separate category. You are my children. I chose you to be mine. Do you understand what we're saying here? Imagine you get a letter from Obama tomorrow morning. Dear Moshe, it came to my attention that you live in Queens. Your parents came from Russia to Queens. You live in Queens 10 years. I want to make you my son. I want to adopt you. I want to live in a White House. I want you to go with me on convention, to sit next to me when I speech. I want to give you unlimited credit card. I just want you to do a few things for me. Not that, nothing major. And you are with me. You are my son. You're special to me. From all the 350 million America, you are number one for me. Please don't be like the rest of the people. You are the son of Mr. Obama or whatever you want to call him. You'll be amazed from the letter or you put it in a toilet and flush? What would you do with that letter? You break to everyone, no? Come, come see what the president sent me. Knowing you, you probably make a big frame here and make five million copies, one in the office, one in the car, one by your grandma, one by your, your in-laws. You want everybody to know, right? No? People who get a college degree, how many copies they make? Put here, this. You go to the lawyers. Every article they ever made on them, so many copies in all the offices, right? Why in that case the Jews took the Torah and turned it into a toilet paper? What happened here? Why none of the Jews in the world even opening the Torah to read what God wants from them? What's going on here? Who knows why? 80% of the Jews have no idea what the Torah is. Anybody here read the Torah once in his life from the beginning to the end? and understand the simple meaning of the instructions? I'm sure there are people who sit here in a room, I do not know any one of you personally, and I never saw any one of your faces before, right? Anyone, I don't know anyone here. I'm sure that at least once in your life you criticize the Torah and the religion, or the rabbis or the religious people, one of the four, which is all one unit. Right or wrong? Right. Now, how is it possible you criticize something that you have no idea what it is? Imagine me criticizing a brain surgeon that I read that he made the surgery and he opened the brain from the right side. What do I know about brain? I don't know anything about brain. I don't know. What do they do? Why they cut? Why they open? Why? I have no idea. Just out of nowhere, I begin to speak against this doctor. He's a moron. He doesn't know what he's doing. What is going on here? So the, then the doctor will ask me with all due respect, who are you? How many years you went to medical school? How many brain surgeries you did? What's your experience? What's your success rate? Nothing, doctor. I'm complete ignorant. I, I didn't finish high school. I never, I never held in my life a medical book. What would happen to me after that moment? I will have to hide 35 years under the rug from the embarrassment. So why we do the same thing? Why we criticize some things that we do not know what it is? The reason is because it's a threat to us. We're afraid, we're intimidated by that. Why? We want to eat whatever we want. We don't want to be limited. We want to make sins as much as we want. If we admit that this is the book of God, every second of our life will have a conscious problem. Look at me, I'm, a, I'm betraying my father in heaven. I'm an ungrateful creature. He gives me oxygen, I use it against him. He gives me money, I use it against him. He gave me a beautiful wife, I make sins against him. He gave me children, I did not educate them like he told me. I'm egoistic, I don't, have, I don't care about his other children, my brothers and sisters, the Jewish nation. All I care is my stomach, all I care is my ego. I, I'm a murderer, I'm a rapist, I'm an angry person, I'm a stingy person, I'm a liar, I'm a crook. All my life is a fake. Nobody wants to live with this feeling. So here, there is an easy way out. We don't believe in a Torah. Ah, I feel great now. Eh, no Hashem, no Torah. Let's eat and drink and do whatever we want. There's only one problem. What you think, or what you think you know, doesn't change reality. 
doesn't change reality. If I go on a highway against traffic, I want to have a shortcut. I'll get killed. Another five minutes. It's just a matter of time. Then I would come and say in a hospital before I died, I didn't know I'm going against traffic. I didn't know. It's so very bad. You didn't know. Someone who eats poison. I didn't know it's poison. You still die. Now comes the next question. I know what you're thinking. I know religious people who suffer more than us. We don't keep Shabbat. They do. I have more money than him. I'm married. He's not. My wife is prettier. Uh, I have five college degrees. He hardly knows how to write. His name is English. He has to pray two, two hours a day. I do whatever I want. I'm healthier. I'm this. I'm smarter. Whatever you may think. When I, when I smoke on Shabbat and drive in my car, how come nothing happened to me? The Torah said that a Jew who doesn't keep Shabbat has no share to the world to come. Billions of years of pleasure, he won't get there. He has no permission to enter. Why? Because Shabbat is the eternal covenant between God and the Jewish nation. If you ever did Kiddush in your life, what do we do? We hold a cup of wine. And this is what we say. V'shamru b'nei Yisrael et ha-Shabbat. And the nation of Israel observed the Sabbath. La'asot et ha-Shabbat ledorotam brit olam. To make the Sabbath for generations an eternal covenant. Eternal. Between me, b'ni uven b'nei Yisrael, between me and the nation of Israel, it's an eternal, ot ile olam, it's a sign for eternity. That I created the world in six days, and in the seven days I rested. And I want my children, the Jewish nation, to be like me. I do not do anything on the seventh day. Every week it's a cycle how the world was created. In the seventh day you'll be like God. You rest. And for that, I'm giving you a shirt to the world to come. What does it mean, the world to come? Do you know? What's a greater pleasure? Physical pleasure or spiritual pleasure? All the people who have all the pleasure in the world get sick and tired of it within a month or two. You buy a brand new Mercedes. How long are you excited from it? Two months, that's it. After two months, it's a Subaru. No different. You bought a beautiful diamond ring. Ah, wow. Psh, wow, wow. Two months later, you tell your husband, can you exchange it for me? Something different. Why? What happened? Two months ago, I didn't sleep at night from the happiness. I remember when I bought my, my first normal car, I lived on the 19th floor. Three times in the middle of the night, I went to the, under, to the indoor garage to look at it. <laughs> Three times. Wow. Wow. Fine. I was a very young guy. You know, fine. I bought a nice car. Yeah. That was my level uh, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. So I looked at the car, and then I go back to, an hour later, I cannot fall asleep. Let me go down again, look at that. Two months later, I was thinking to myself, what a lousy car. I go get sell it, I buy something different. I know people every month, they buy a different watch. Why? The excitement is over, they need it again. Right? Same thing food, you eat steak every day. Every day steak, after a month, the, the servant who brings you the, the steak, he said, I'm begging you, can you change it to fish? No, steak for the rest of your life, three times a day. What happened to you? You shoot yourself in the head. Two months ago when they serve you the first steak, wow, what a dinner. Three months later, you vomit when you see it. <laughs> Why? Because God made the world that everything physical is temporary and the pleasure is limited. Once you get used to it, you don't like it anymore. Buy the nicest tie in the world, $500. The best designer, beautiful color. Two months later, you put it in a box to give away. Huh? In Muncie, there's a rich family. They buy so much, food, so much fancy clothing. Most of it, they don't even remove the price tag because they bought so much. So the woman wear it today, then tomorrow a new outfit, the next day. By the time she already got to the 30th outfit, she already got tired of it because it's in the closet. She sees it every day for a month. She so doesn't even wear it. I, I'm not exaggerating. $800 outfit, they put it in a box for Metzios. And the poor family, sometimes you see in Muncie, a poor family, they hardly make a living. And the woman dressed like 
What's her name? Uh, the wife of Donald Trump. <laughs> they drive a lousy car. The car worth a hundred dollars, and the suit and the suit that she wears three thousand dollars. Why? Some some psycho bought so much, they didn't have an opportunity to wear it. Ten a ten pairs of shoes in one shot. Wear it once, and it goes right away to somebody else. Why? Everything material, it's an illusion. The pleasure is an illusion. It's not a real pleasure. But every human being is dying to have a spiritual pleasure. You know how many Israelis go to India to look for spirituality, to cults in Germany, all kinds of things. You know how many goyim are begging me to teach them Torah? They're willing to pay fortune. Fortune! It's amazing. Just to hear Torah. Why? Everyone wants uh, spirituality. This is Goim who are already involved with the Torah. They know it's such great pleasure. They're willing to pay. And they don't have yet Sarara, even inclination. <coughs> spirituality is much more delicious than physical pleasure, without a doubt. Sh try. You can see right away. Did you ever feel great that you, took, you saw a person that is sleeping on the street and is starving? and you bring him a pita bread, I don't know, falafel, whatever, and you give him, and you see how he eats it, and kiss your hand, thank you, thank you, three days I didn't eat. What did you get by that? Nothing. But you have great feeling. If you could buy that feeling with a thousand dollars, you would do it. Such great feeling. There's no words to describe. Love. Love is for free. You met your wife, you go, and in the beginning everyone is in love. Six months usually it takes. Until the problem begins. Today, six weeks. Next generation, six hours. Some of them already fight in the middle of the wedding. Why did you speak to your cousin? <laughs> She's getting married tonight. She's worried. Why? The, the, the divorce rate in the non-religious world already exceeded more than 70%. Can you tell me why people are getting married if they know the statistics do not lie? Every hundred couples suddenly get divorced. And the other 30 suffer every day in their marriage. Why they don't get divorced? They're embarrassed. They, because of their parents, because of the children, because of the money, because they're insecure what's going to happen after. So after, uh, after you really screen 100%, maybe one or two of them are happy in the secular worlds. I'm not exaggerating. I promise you, I have experienced 16 years, I hear their complaints. No matter whether they're rich, poor, it doesn't even matter. To be the richest people, they suffer every second of their life. Marriage that should be the greatest adventure, the greatest pleasure, the great security, great feeling, great partnership, according to the Torah, become the biggest nightmare. Court, lawyers, problem, cursing, lashonara, gossip, fighting, ugliness, jealousy, oof, nightmare, hell. So why did you get married? Well, what's the point? If you know, it's just a matter of time until there'll be a number on the wall. In Israel, there's one old man, he sits in a rabbanut. In Israel, there's two rooms. Marriage, get. Marriage, divorce. Two rooms, one next to the other. You want to fill an application to get married. You want to, so they have to check the woman if she's Jewish. They teach her about nida, purity, mikveh. They teach her some things, they get a certificate, they give you a date, you need the rabbi, they send you a rabbi to get married. You want to bring your own rabbi? Fine. But they, they check first that she's Jewish, they bring two witnesses that know that you're not married already. That's a procedure. Right next to it, there's a divorce room. There's an old man who sits there already for a few years. Every couple who comes, they say, do me a favor, write yourself over there in the next room already. So they look, they see a sign, Gerushin, divorce. So they get angry at him. They say to him, you're not, a, you're not ashamed? You wish us to, to fill an application in a divorce room? You say, no, God forbid. I don't wish you anything bad. I hope you never have to come back here. But I see all the couples who come here, within four years return here, and then they have to wait two years online. And that two years is a real nightmare until they get, uh, get rid of each other. Because they already want to move on with their life, and now they have to wait two years until they approve their divorce. So I'm telling you to save time, already take. So by the time you come here, you won't have to wait more than two, three months. It sounds like a joke, but it's reality today. You got the point. Why marriages are not successful? 
because people never corrected their personality. They're full of ego. It's all a show of laziness, egoistic. Nobody cares about anyone. Everyone cares only about his stomach and his pleasure. You heard about Bin Laden, the ultra-religious, fanatic Muslim? What's the first thing he did when the Americans came? He pushed his wife to the bullets, and they shot her. Shot her, yeah. He was hiding behind his wife. That's the report. All the soldiers that participated in the operation, they say that he was so panicking, he pushed his wife to the soldiers, and they, he was hiding behind his wife. What a kosher Jew does jump in front of his wife, that he gets the bullet, not her. He had three wives, he could have fought together. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you convinced me. <laughs> Marriage, according to the Torah, it's a great thing, and can stay great forever, if you only do it according to the laws of God. Time is running out. And I just want to conclude the questions that I started. If God put me here, there is obviously a purpose for me. And of course, he did not create the world without giving a book. He gave me a book of instruction. Now you may ask me a question. There is 80,000 religions and cults who started after Judaism. How would we know which one of them is the truth? Okay, for sure God gave a book. For sure. We understand. It's common sense. But which one? The Torah? The New Testament? The Quran? Buddhism? Hinduism? Hare Krishna? Which one? What usually is the original one? The first or the second or the third? Which one is the original one? First, right? Which religion is the first religion? Judaism. 3,321 years old. What came after? Buddhism. 2,400 years old. What came after? Christianity, Christianity 2,000 years old. What came after? Quran. Quran, 1,400 years old. Not even, less. So which one came first? Torah. Christians and Muslims do not deny that the Jews received the Torah. Why? Why are they so generous to us? Why? They're not exactly in love with us, most of them, right? There are some good of them, but most of them are not exactly crazy about the Jews. So why they all admit that the Jews received the Torah? Not only they admit, they adopted the Torah as part one of their religion. The Old Testament, the New Testament. That's what they learn in the church. The Torah and another book. The Torah and the Quran. In the Quran, they speak about Ibrahim, Abraham, and Sarah, and Isaac, and Yosef, and Me'arat HaMachpelah, everything. Moshe, Musa, everything, it's in the Quran. It's all from the Torah. Same thing, they copy parts from the Torah in the Quran. Why? How can we deny such an event? Imagine somebody today come to try to deny September 11. No, 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 there was no September 11. No, no, it's an illusion. It really never happened. Who would, it, would, it would waste a minute on a person like this or no? Trying to deny that the Jews received the Torah, it's even worse. Why? The whole world saw that the Jews are receiving the Torah live from God. The Jews heard the voice of God. Twelve million people heard Moshe and God speaking. The first two commandments, millions of people heard the voice of God. How do I know? Maybe somebody planted it in history. How do I know? Maybe it's an illusion? The answer is very simple. If I come to you and I try to make you religious, are you interested tomorrow to become religious or you prefer to do whatever you feel like? Most people, they want to live according to their convenience. They don't want instruction. They don't want a boss. They don't want guilt problem, conscious problem. Limitation. They don't want. They let me live. Let, live and let live. Leave me, leave me alone, Rabbi. I'm not interested. Very, yeah, very nice speech. Let me go back to my pork, to my Christine, to my stealing in a business, to my picnics on Shabbat with my cigarette and my convertible Lexus. That's what I like. Leave me alone. I'm not interested to live according to a book. That's what most people. How is it possible that 12 million Jews became religious overnight? Especially. When ma many of the things in religion is against human logic, sacrifices, it's very expensive. Killing animals because I made a sin doesn't make sense to me. 
eating only kosher for Pesach for seven days. Not allowed bread, no spaghetti, no beer, no whiskey for seven. Who cares what I eat? Does it make the world a different place if I eat bread or matzah? Oh, so, sukkah, sit in a sukkah, leave your $10 million mansion and move to a little lousy sukkah for eight days. Take lulav and etrog and go like this. Put a little black box here and say, Shmai, so what, what, what does it mean? What's, what's all this? But everybody agreed to accept it. Some of the laws, some of the laws is not so simple. It costs money, donations. You have to give 10% of your net income donations. It's not something people like, but the religious people do. Why? The answer is, when I give you a book, and you open the book and you begin to read it, and you see over there that in the book there are 100 miracles that happened to you in the last few months. 100 miracles. Each one of the miracles is against all odds. It's very difficult to believe that something like this can happen. The ocean split. You went through and the Egyptians drowned. All Egypt became blood. Every firstborn in Egypt fell and died in a minute. All kinds of things. Bread are falling from heaven. If you read this in a book, if one of the miracles did not happen exactly as it's described in a book, what would happen? Who knows? If 12 million people are standing in front of me and I brought them a book from God, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. Here is the book that God gave me to give you. Here. And you begin to read the book. And you read. You used to be slaves in Egypt. If you were not slaves in Egypt, what would you say? Here is a mistake in a book. How can it be from God? God doesn't make mistakes. It says here that we were all in Egypt. We were never in Egypt. Ah, so we confirm. We were in Egypt. Okay, what's next? We were slaves. True. God took us out. True. How? He opened the ocean. True. One of the details from hundreds of things were not correct. They would raise their hand. Excuse me, Moshe. We respect you, but you're a liar. You're lying. You say God gave you the book, right? You're lying. It says here that we went through the ocean split and the water was standing like a wall. We never saw such a thing. It says here that all of us heard you and God speaking and we heard the voice of God. I don't remember listening and hearing the voice of God. I don't remember such a thing. You understand what we're going here or no? If one of the things that are in the Torah did not happen, nobody would ever agree to accept these laws. They will make a party. Ah, we got rid of him. We can do whatever we want. One. It's not divine. If there is one mistake in a book, it's not divine. The Torah has knowledge that no human being was able to know. Only the creator of the world. 72% of the water is water, of the world is water. The Torah comes to the Jews and says, everything that has fins and scales you're allowed to eat. From all the water in the world comes the oral Torah, which goes together with the written Torah. We receive it also in Mount Sinai. The oral Torah says a statement. Only God could have said it. No person was able to write it. What does it say? Everything you ever find in the water. Which water? 72% of the world, almost the whole world is blue. Any water, it's very deep, miles, very deep. Millions of things are moving every second all over the rivers, the lakes, billions, trillions. Every minute a new species created that yesterday was not even exist because they all mix between them. A and B mix created another species. The Torah was given 3,321 years ago. When the Torah was given half of the things who lives in the water will not even exist. And the Torah promise, you will never find anything in the water that has scales and does not have fins. If there is scales, they're always going to have fins, guarantee. A person can guarantee such a thing? What person has knowledge about what's happening in the oceans? What person knows the next 3,000 years how many new species will be created? What person can guarantee in a book that there will never be something with scales 
that doesn't have fins. All it needs, one snake in the water that has scales that you can scratch off, it doesn't have fins, it has a tail. That will be the end of Judaism. The Torah says, every animal is kosher if it has two conditions. It needs to chew its cud and have split hooves. If it has these two signs, it's kosher. Whether you know it, you don't know it, it doesn't matter. If it has these two witnesses, two signs, it's kosher. Comes the Torah and say, there are four animals in the world that may confuse you, but they're not kosher. Why they may confuse you? Because they have one sign. They don't have two signs. All the other animals don't have any sign. They don't chew their cud and they don't have split hooves at all. But there are four animals the Torah writes in the world that have only one sign. The rabbit, the hare, the camel, and the pig. Either they chew their cud or they have split hooves, one of the two, and they are not kosher. Be careful. Why do I tell you this? If one person will find another species in the whole world, ever, that have one sign, that's the end of the Torah. It's not divine. If it's from God, God say from two million different animals that we know, there are four exceptional. I created the whole world, I know. There are two million different names. Two million different animals with names that we know in the archives today. Two million, you know what's two million? It's all the way from here to Tel Aviv in a line. And four of them are exceptional, which means if you find one more exceptional kind, it's the first mistake in the Torah. No more Shabbat, no more Yom Kippur, no more nothing. It's all over. Why? It's not from God. Here, here is a proof. You understand? No other religion has proofs in it. Nothing, not even one. Every page in the Quran has mistakes. If you don't believe me, give me your email. I'll send you a comic book that one smart Muslim made. One Muslim made a comic book. And inside the comic book, he brought verses from the Quran. After you read it, you, you will never believe that almost two billion people follow this book. So many mistakes, so much nonsense, so many human errors. The New Testament, it says that the, the, the cave of Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov is in the city of Shechem. Nablus. Every fool knows it's in Hebron. It's always been there. Mistake in a book. God doesn't know where the cave of Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov is. Forgot. Imagine a book from God, the Twin Towers collapse in Brooklyn. <laughs> There's any, any, any point of wasting another minute on a book like this if in the first page you say that the Twin Towers collapse in Brooklyn? We know it's not from God. God is not so foolish. Chas v'shalom, what is making such foolish mistake? Even I wouldn't make this mistake. Who can believe that this is from God? Almost two billion Christians. Watch my debate. I brought it to you here. My debate with the priest. It's in English. It's in English, yeah. Watch it. It's a million dollar treat. We had more than a million listeners. Hundreds of Christians Jewish. became Jewish Jewish. thanks to this. Personally, Me yeah. against the professor, Christian four, professor. Four hours. Three, three hours. Three hours. He was drinking like eight bottles of water. Eight, <laughs> 17. 17 bottles he finished. <laughs> and in the end, I can... Tell him what he said at the end. He what said in the end in case you are lazy to watch, but it's very entertaining. It says in the end, you put me in a hole, you got me down deep there. I don't see how I'm going to get myself out of there. So I told him, I just proved to you it's a false religion. He didn't say no. Of course not, I proved to him. That's it, end of argument. But he said something very strange. He said, my heart doesn't let me leave it. It was so good to me over the years, being religious in this phony religion. So I'm already so used to it, I just don't see myself getting out of there. It's like an addiction. Someone who's addicted to drugs, go and now get out of it. We are the only nation that had the truth of God. And we put it aside. Isn't it a shame? I would like to finish with one last sentence. In case you didn't know, and in case you know it's worth to repeat it. The Torah says, what is the afterlife? What is the afterlife? What is all this reward that God promised to the righteous Jews who goes according to the Torah, they observe the Sabbath, they eat kosher, they keep modesty, all these things that the Torah requires. What is the reward for it? The Torah says, I'm testing you to reward you in your end. 
and you should choose the good, and you should choose the life. You are my children, etc., etc. There's many hundreds of verses that speaks about the test of life. And what is the reward? The punishments in the Torah are very, very clear. You don't go my way, the price is tremendous, horrible, horrific. And it's very clear. The Torah says what the punishments are. But the reward, there's not that much. So the oral Torah asks these questions. What does, the, what does the Torah say about the heaven, about the life of eternity, about the world of the souls, the eternal life? What does the Torah say about it? We want a description. What's going to happen over there? Jet ski? Coca-Cola? What's going to be over there? What is this huge reward? Listen good now, it's worth it. First, the Torah say, trying to explain to a person, to a blind person, what the color blue looks like. Is it possible? You take a blind person from birth, he never saw color. Itzik, come, come. Today we're going to teach you what the color blue looks like. It looks like green. You say, what's green? <laughs> it's like the sky, very relaxing. What's the sky? It says it's a, you know, it's a color, it's like the ocean. What's the ocean? No matter what you're going to say, he is unable to understand. He doesn't have it in his computer. Open his eyes for five minutes, show him blue, and close it. That's it. You don't need to explain. He knows now what it is. But computer that operates in Hebrew, if you put words in English, he won't know what you're talking about. Arabic, you put in Hebrew, he won't understand. Is not capable of receiving the information. So the Torah concludes in two verses. This is what it says. Listen good. Tzadikim Yoshvim, the righteous Jews, are sitting and receiving the greatness. Oh, they're sitting with the crown to their head. It's all spiritual analogies. And receive and enjoying. The greatness of God. Here I'll tell you in Hebrew. Yoshvim tzadikim ve'atroteem l'rosheem ve'nehenim miziv ha'shchina. Translation. The righteous Jews in the afterlife in heaven where God promised to the righteous Jews that that's where they go if they listen to him. And God forbid, I don't want to tell you where they go if they didn't listen to him. But if they listen to him and they pass the test, they sitting with special spiritual crown to their heads and enjoying the greatness of God. What is it? I don't know. I leave it to your imagination. You use your head. Now there is one more sentence and we'll finish with that. The Torah says like this. Yafa sha'a achat shel korat ruach ba'olam hazeh mikol chayei ha'olam haba. Who understand Hebrew here? Can you translate what I said? No, it's hard a little bit. It's a, it's a, it's a Tanakh. It's a Torah language. I'll translate. One hour in the afterlife of the righteous Jews, the reward of the righteous Jews in the afterlife, once the soul separates from the body, after the verdict is that you go there. One hour of the spiritual pleasure that God paid to the righteous Jews is greater than this entire world combined. Translation, if you take all the tens of billions of people, Jews, non-Jews, who ever lived here, all of them, take their entire life term, 70, 80, 90 years, 100 years, 50 years, combine all the years of trillion people, from the beginning of the world until the world will be over. Combine all the pleasure they ever had. Sport, women, food, hobbies, money, uh, whatever you, you name it. Any kind of pleasure you heard about. Combine all the pleasure that ever took place here of all the people combined. Will not be equal to their reward of the religious righteous Jews one hour in the afterlife. Now multiply it by endless amount of years. It's endless. It's eternal. Billions of years, it's not even the beginning. There's no words to describe the pleasure of keeping Shabbat. Not to talk about 
that over here the life is much better. Forget about the afterlife. That's a great bonus. Over here, the life of the religious families is a million times better than the non-religious. The children are much better, the education, the peace in the family, everything is much greater. They live with faith, with emuna. There's a good book, read it, Garden of Emuna. Right away, you see how your life changed completely. Right away, just by reading it. Faith. You have a father that watches over you and protects you. You never worry. You know what great life you have? Less sicknesses less stress, and you know, you are achieving something, you on the way something. Religious people do not commit suicide, maybe one to a billion. The non-religious people, many, four, five percent of them kill themselves. You know how many suicide cases in Israel? Religious people don't commit suicide. Why? They know it doesn't want it. I'm in a test, I have to pass it. What's the point of leaving the test after two minutes? I got to pass the test. Why? It's a ticket for eternal life. What does it mean to shoot my head? Religious people don't have divorce cases, rates like the non-religious people. They have less heart attacks. Bnei Brak, it's a city in Israel, the last in a, in a table of all the cities in the world, Bnei Brak has less heart attacks than any other city in the world. And there's thousands of cities all over the world. Bnei Brak has less heart attacks than any other city. Check the statistic. Google. Bnei Brak. Why? 99.8% of the people Shomer Shabbat and learn Torah daily. No heart attacks. Heart attacks come from being under stress seven days a week, 365 days a year. There's no day of rest. Phone, business, thinking, ma, this, driving, shopping. Non-stop. No days of rest. Why there's so much divorce? Very simple. If I give you banana ice cream, it's your most favorite ice cream, in a, you, you dream about this. And I say from now on, three times a day, you get from me banana ice cream. How long it take until you begin to vomit from it? <laughs> First day, you lick the paper. You know how the people, when the ice cream is finished, they go like this, maybe they miss a drop. Second day, still licking the paper. After a week, half of the ice cream goes to the cat. A month after, what happened when the person brings the banana ice cream to your mouth? Oh, no, please, I'm begging you, please, bring water instead. No, no, eat. <laughs> what do you mean? A month ago, you fought with me, you want everyday ice cream. Eat. That's what happened to the Chilonim. His wife is the most beautiful wife in the world. He is the most handsome guy in the world. Money they have, nice house, nice car, five nannies, everything is fine. Six months after they marry, they cannot stand each other. Why the soup is like this? How many times I told you put more paprika? Put more salt? I can't stand this. Why the toys are on the floor? Does he really care about the, the toys? Does he really care about the food? He can't stand there anymore. The, ma the most beautiful woman in the world. All these rich and famous and beautiful people, they have the highest divorce rate. Six, seven times they get divorced. They're all in heavy drugs. They're all in a miserable life. Why? Because God said, physical pleasure, if you want to continue enjoying from it forever, must be on and off. Cannot be always on. Which means, you meet your wife. What did Hashem do in the body of a woman? A cycle. Every month, period, few days, after she gets clean, the Torah says seven more days, 12 days of the month, you don't touch your wife. Then after that, it's getting all renewed. Every month, it's like the first date. That's how it is, forever. Why? Because there was a time out. If there is no time out, three, four months after, you cannot look at her and she cannot look at you. It's all a show. She's embarrassed to tell you. So she said, I have a headache, this, my back hurts, this, my mother got me angry, all kinds of excuses. I'm tired, <laughs> the kids got drove me crazy, that, I'm angry at you, why? Whatever, all kinds of things. What's going on here? If they kill Hashem, the manufacturer of mankind, man and female, put them together as a unit, what did he say? You want to enjoy? Time out. Up, a month, separation. Everything gets renewed. All this passion get renewed. Without it, the marriage has limited amount of days. And it's over. 
With this, life is great. Try it, see. If I'm wrong or right. I, 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 it's not my advice. It's the creator of the world gave this advice. You can argue with him. Everything you have, he designed. You want to argue with the engineer? No, you do it. I don't want to argue with him. I take his word. I know from experience that that's the way it works. I see the people live with it, people who live without it. I see how their life look. Where do you find 60 years old couples that walk hands to hands in the street like, like, like newlyweds in the secular world? Where do you find it? Real romantic love. Like, like thinking about each other all the Why? It's annoying. Try it. If you know Shabbat with the family, you see it, your wife, your children, you enjoy, divrei Torah, time out from all the television, this, that, driving, shopping, invite some friends, spend Shabbat together, synagogue, singing, praying, speaking to God, life is great. No problem, you can still enjoy food, you can still dress nice, you can still drive a nice car, you can still go on vacation here and there if you keep it kosher, you can still swim, you can still play basketball, almost everything you do, you can do. In a kosher way. And get eternity of pleasure after. Or God forbid, get cut out of eternity. Do you know what a disaster? Think about it. Do you know for driving to the mall what the, a what the price there is to pay? Did you check? Did you check what you're cooking for yourself? In the end we have to eat it. I promise you. Don't take my word for it. Watch the CDs, listen to the DVDs. The more you listen, the more educated you're going to be. The more educated you're going to be, you're going to see some of the things you are doing daily. It's worse than poison for you and your children. You will be so embarrassed in five years from now that this is how you used to live. Some of the pictures that you have right now and you're taking, you will do everything you can to destroy them. You won't be able to look at yourself in five years from now. Some of the things, the way you dress, the way you... Some of the videos, how you talk. Eventually, when the soul purified... You look back how you used to be and you cannot look at yourself. Forget about other people. I'm telling you, I know, I've been dealing with people 16 years. You say, now, right now, I'm the greatest guy on earth. I'm the greatest girl on earth. What is he talking about? Don't believe me. Call, call me in five years. Tell me if I was right. Then the soul becomes purified. Everything else in life is different. Everything. Now you understand what's important, what's not important. What's to cry for? Why not to cry for? 99% of the thing you are crying for doesn't worth even a drop of, uh, of tear. Nothing. Waste of time. All this agony and stress for nothing. Life is a blink of the eye. Before you realize, you go to the real life. You worry about what's going to happen here. Why does it come from? Where does it come from? From ignorance. The biggest enemy to the life of a Jew is ignorance. He doesn't know what he lives for. It's no direction, no Torah, no God. No reward and punishment. No set of rules. Nothing. Live like animals. Whatever I feel like I do. Today I'm in this mood. Tomorrow in that mood. As long as I don't get caught by the police. But it's not a life. A person has to head somewhere. And nobody can give us a better advice than our creator. You have to fight your desire. That's the test. It's not kosher. Not allowed to eat. He gives me a million dollars to eat a steak of pork. I won't touch it. It's not a test for me. Maybe 25 years ago it was a test. Today it's a joke. You tell me, violate Shabbat, I'll give you a billion dollars. I'll give you 10 houses in Beverly Hills. Just one time, light a cigarette or, or turn the car on. It's not a test for me. I have other tests. I'm not saying, you know, I'm perfect. But some things, it's a joke. It's not even a test. Well, there's a boss to the world and I'm going to do something against him and benefit? It's only an illusion. Why don't we get punished right away? Why don't we get rewarded right away if the Torah said there's reward and punishment? Why it doesn't happen right away? You shot somebody, a minute later somebody shot you. You stole, right away you lost double. You violate Shabbat, right away something happened to you. Why it's not working like this? Because it will eliminate the choice, the free choice. There's no test. If every person who violates Shabbat, right away something happened to him, nobody will do it. Who wants to get affected? Somebody just stole a hundred dollars and a minute later he lost two hundred. Then he tried again and then right after that he lost again. Who would steal? Who would cares? Who will not go to pray? Who will cheat? Nobody will do anything. Shabbat come, nobody would move. Why? 
I just saw what happened to Michalel Shabbat. I've been an idiot to do the same thing, but we don't deserve a reward. If the punch comes right after, a minute after you do something, right away you get punished. And you're not doing it because you love yourself, not because you love God, not because you passed this test. You just don't want to die. You just don't want to be sick. You don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose your marriage. So you are forced to do it. That's not what God wants. You can put a gun to your head, and right away the punishment comes and it's over. But nobody will ever make a scene. Same thing, the reward. If everyone who gives tzedakah right away may double, the Arabs all day would give tzedakah to the yeshiva. The Nazis will, bu- will build the temples again, everything they destroyed. Why? Very nice. Every dollar we give the rabbi right away, we double our money. Great business. They deserve a reward for it. They did it for the truth of God or because they wanted to double their money. The, the test is you just gave a thousand dollars to a poor family and tomorrow you lost a deal. You went to pray in a synagogue and when you came out they tore your car. You understand? You just uh, robbed the bank, five years nothing happened to you. You enjoyed the money and you say, where is the justice? The justice is in the book. It's just a matter of time. God does not react immediately. But the Torah says, Ain ro'a ve'ozen shoma'ad ve'chol ma'asecha basefer nikhtavim. There's a eye who watch over you all the time. There's a he who listens to you and everything you say is been registered in the book of God. For the future to come, the trial will begin for good or for bad. Now it's your choice. Do you want to change or you want to continue? But I did what I had to do. Thank you to Avraham for inviting me here. I hope I didn't speak too strong for you. And if I did, don't hate me for that. You can appreciate it. Much, it's much easier to appreciate it than to be upset. Why? If a doctor tells you about your physical situation, he's doing you a favor. He's not going to offend you. He's not trying to put you down. He has no incentive to make you feel bad. The opposite. He wants to wake you up that you'll take care of the problem. Maybe you need a surgery. It hurts. It costs money. It's not convenient, but in six months you're alive. What's better, to tell you take to Advil and in six months you'll be dead? Well, then you're going to say, what kind of doctor you are? Why didn't you tell me my situation when you sat in front of me? The, uh, a rabbi is a spiritual doctor. His job, if he's a kosher rabbi, to tell the people what their situation is. You don't have to believe me. Take the Torah tonight when you go home, begin to read. Yes? I'm sorry. The problem with this generation, I think, is there are... The good rabbis that, that you spoke about, and there are the ones that are not that good. And when, and when secular people, like you say, they see this, it turns them off, and it turns them away. Uh, that, that's the biggest problem, I think, Okay, uh, let me answer to you. Yeah. The Torah never said that Judaism is determined based on the behaving of the Jews. Nowhere in the Torah it says, be Jewish like Moshe, be Jewish like the Rambam. Be Jewish like the Rabbi X or Rabbi Z. No. There are sinners out there. There are people with yamaka who make sins. Every person has evil inclination, yetzerara, desires, whether they're religious, whether they're not. They all have the same desires. You have desire for food, I have desire for food. Desire for women, I have the same desires. The difference is I know I must work on myself to cure myself from those desires and to keep them under control. Doesn't mean a person is always succeed. There's, it's like a drug addict. He's trying to get out of it. But there's some moments that he falls. Just because you saw a drug addict that once in a while is still doing it, but he's fighting with himself, doesn't mean that it's permitted. The answer is, if you see a religious person who stole, you feel bad for him. He just made a sin and he's going to get punished for it. If you saw he's not so nice to you, it's his problem, not yours. He is doing a, he's making a mistake. But the Torah is always the same. The Torah never modified based on the behaving of the Jews. No. The Torah was always the same Torah. You should not steal. It was always the same. You should not steal. You should not kill. You should not rape. You should not lie. You should not. You should not. You should not. It was always the same. Just because there's, like you say, rabbis or some religious people who don't know how to behave or they don't learn Torah, they're busy with their business all day, just because they have yamaka, yamaka is three dollars and a beard is for free. Can become religious in three dollars in a minute. It doesn't mean you're really religious. It's a custom. It's fake. But Adraba, you won't be fakers. You do it in the right way. 
There's many Baalei Tshuva in this generation, close to a million all over the world, Jews in the last 20 years who became Shomer Shabbat, became religious. Every one of them is perfect? Of course not. Some of them continue to watch dirty things. Some of them continue to lie. Some of them continue to steal in a business from their customers. Some of them are still bad father and bad husband and have bad traits. Of course. That's why the life is a test. If everything was like this, what's the test? Why you deserve a reward if it's so easy? It's difficult. Don't judge other people until you be in their position. Now you have to also know, certain things that is easy for you is much more difficult to your friend. For instance, there are certain things that is very easy for me not to do. And I, it kills me to see how people are able to do such a thing. But if I was in their shoes, I would know why it's so difficult for them. Sometimes you see a person not religious, but he's honest, naturally. You put diamonds in front of him, he doesn't touch. Naturally, he has no desire to steal. Then you see a person that all day he's thinking about stealing. All day he's fighting with himself. It's very difficult for him. Why? Every one of us, remember what I said before, is reincarnated with the weaknesses that he died before. That's why I had a guy from Long Island, a millionaire young guy that made $60 million in a two or three months deal that he made. He bought himself a mansion in a big, very fancy area in Long Island. He drives a sport car. Mamash lives like a, like a movie star. Finally, I, have, I made him religious. He, ag he agreed to keep Shabbat in one lecture. And it took three months to convince him to put filin. Filin is two minutes a day. <laughs> Tfilin. Shema <laughs> Israel, it's over. Two minutes a day! Every day I had to call him. No, did you put filin? Well, oh, oh, no, no, what time is it? Six o'clock. It's, it's a night. At night you cannot put filin. You have to put it during the day. Okay, okay, now I'm going to do it. Every day he has to fight with himself for filin. Then you ask yourself, Shabbat is harder to keep than filin. If you're not used to keep Shabbat, it's more sacrifice than to agree to put something on your hand for two minutes. But apparently it's not the same difficulty for every person. For some person it's very difficult not to lie. For some people, I, I know people, believe me, completely not religious. They, they, if one day they try to lie, they become like a tomato. They can't lie. They don't know how to lie. And I know other people, oh, they lie. They convince you that your name is not Yitzchak, it's Moshe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, why? Everyone with his weaknesses. Some people, all they care is women, women, women. Some people are devoted husband. Not religious, naturally. I have a wife, he's happy. It's depend on the weaknesses of the person from his previous reincarnation. You know what you weak at. Don't ever take an example from sinners and people who are losers. Learn from the winners. And the, w and the way to elevate yourself is to be connected to the Torah daily. You have my website on the CDs, divineinformation.com. There is 600 lectures there. Any topic you ever thought about, you have a whole lecture about it. Marriage, success, success in a marriage, raising children, sicknesses, health, Shabbat. Whatever you want, you have over there. Go over the topic in English, in Hebrew, whatever you want. Take advantage. It's all for free. What else do you want? Lectures for free, CDs for free, food for free, everything, just do it. Don't continue to live in a lie. In the end, there's a price to pay. You still have doubts? Come to me, call me. Here, I give you my cards, my telephone number are all on the CDs. Cell phone, you can call anytime. Leave me, send email, ask questions. I help you, all free of charge. Nobody asks you for donation, nobody wants anything from you. Pure help. Pure, I know it's hard to get it in these days. But I promise you, pure help. Nobody will solicitate you. I will never send you invitation for donation, no fundraising, no dinners. Never in my life. Look at all my lectures. If you find one time that I did fundraising, don't ever watch me again. Nothing we don't want from you. All we want is that you're going to save yourself. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>